everyone. Thank you. I see some new faces. Viviani Tran, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And Khan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I think, Vivi, you wanted to talk about last week a little bit. Um, if there are any questions, seeing that you had a week to reflect. Just questions, concerns, comments, anything you notice related to parenting? You learned a little bit, huh? Well, a lot of it um, depends, right? Uh, what you got out of it from conscious parenting. It's, uh, it is different, right? It's in its approach because it, uh, a lot of the energy is spent towards uh, looking at the self that is the parent in relation to the child, with the understanding that the child is going to be the child. But how we, we respond and how we behave, how we act, can make a difference. So there was a lot of things I wanted to talk about today, and I narrowed it down, I think, to two, two things. Vivi doesn't know yet. I like that it was a surprise. <laughs> I come and like, we're a culture. So let's see what we got. <laughs> um, yes. There's a lot here, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is that's something that just came up from two parents this week, and I've had I've been doing this for 18 years, and especially working with families and parents. The common, I think, question or a very popular question asked of me is, uh, "What do I do when my child is disrespectful?" Or how do I deal with disrespect? Well, lo and behold, I think most of you know that we're writing a book on this. Mm -hmm. We actually have a chapter on that. Uh, what you do with disrespect. Um, there are six things that we recommend that you can do. I'm going to go straight down, because I like this part, down to number five and six first. Okay? And then we'll talk about what that means. Well, it will speak for itself. Um, number five is, let, oh, well, let me do number six. Show the child unconditional respect. That's what you do. That's one of the best things that you can do when a child's acting uh, disrespectful. And the best way to do this is to ask the child what she is feeling or thinking. Help her understand her process so she can help you understand <coughs> years. Gently guide the conversation towards achieving a more positive solution. How powerful would it be in response to a child's quote-unquote disrespect, you return in kind respect? Now I said last week, if you recall, um, disrespect is not a real thing. It doesn't doesn't exist in a child. I've been working 18 years and I've never encountered one. Someone agrees. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, um, a child disrespect is really a child dysregulated. And a, a, a child who is um, impulsive. A child who doesn't understand the rules of engagement. And that's where we come in. That's, that's the conscious part. I want, you to, I want you to listen very carefully to number four. One of the best way you can teach a child respect is to teach the child respect by helping her to recognize what respect is, what it looks like. And this is how you do it. Point out all the things you could do better as a parent. Ask the child if she has ever felt disrespected by you. Ask the child what a disrespectful tone coming from you sound like. Ask the child what a disrespectful attitude coming from you looks like. And then ask her what a disrespectful response from you feel like. And then ask her to help you. 
that the next time you are being disrespectful, what sort of consequences you are deserving of. And I guarantee you it's likely that she will be more forgiving to you than, than we are of her. Uh, as conscious parents, just a reminder, there are certain traits or aspects we call virtues that are tied to what we call our humanity, but that allows us to be better parents for the child. So just, to, just those two responses alone, you can see it's not what would be considered typical. Yes? Have you ever dealt with a, a disrespectful child? Consider what your responses were. All right? um, likely in the realm of reprimand. Or in the realm of explaining a lot beyond um, the ability to attend all that you're saying, right? So it's kind of a ineffective way to try to convey respect. This is what respect is, and we go on and on and on. I know I'm very verbal, so I know I do that quite often. Um, but I'm curious, and I don't know at this point, I don't want to get in the way of your process time, but I was mm. wondering, because this is such powerful, four, five, and six, I'm wondering what showed up for you when this complete different approach was presented. How many of you consider that before? And how many of you have used that before? Or not? So we'll show that. Anything? And that would Ren? Well, normally when you when you're treated with disrespect, you kind of get irritated and you kind of get angry. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I might say something like, you know, you need to take a time out so your attitude changes and when you're going to you know speak with me speak to me with more respect we'll have this conversation you know but that's not at all what you guys are talking about do you know what i mean um and recently on a phone conversation um my teenage um brenda Hurst said something that just floored me and i couldn't set boundaries um, this is not a boundary issue. This is a, a child who's regular, as I said. Yeah. A child confused, a child lost, a child afraid. Mm -hmm. And then they're responding. Yes, you agree? Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you understand that, yeah. and you can click um, in your head quick enough, I see. then you <laughs> come from a different place. Yes, yes yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So then that leads uh, to number four take responsibility. A rude child bothers us because it reflects our parenting. That's why that's why we're responding. Because it's something about that that child is acting out and acting up is making us insecure about ourselves. And it could be a, a number of things, but that's probably at the top of the list. It does reflect in some ways our inadequacy, our uh, sense of uh, insecurity, incompetency. So rather than not taking responsibility for the child's disrespect because you don't want any part of it then take on the responsibility for not having respect of your child respond can come off as quite disrespectful right but but you don't think that because you you call it parenting right? <laughs> uh, that's the mind trick we play on ourselves right on ourselves easy to force on ourselves <laughs> Um, well, I think we are deluded in, in, in that way. But I mean, what I'm reading to you makes sense because it makes sense. This it's not that difficult, right? Um, that's because it taps. It comes from a place. Parenting. This style of parenting comes from a place of humanity. I think what we tend to forget is that they're human, uh, and that we reduce them to just a behavior. I have two year olders, as I said last time, who come into my office and they play with the dolls with me and they're playing the roles of the parent. They know what your role is. Right? They, 
they know what their daughter's role is, so they, they understand. Um, and besides, with conscious parenting, why not then use your powers of consciousness to uh, create the habit of reason, of compassion, uh, of joy you know, for the child? So, and we can, we can do that. We're in a position to do that. Number two, oh, you like this. Be humble. You know, when the child acts out and acts up and they come off as disrespectful, you are the greatest gift that you can offer them. Be humble. The beautiful thing about humility is that we desire to gain nothing extra from the child. And we're okay with that because that leaves us more room for authentic play. How cool is that? When you're not fighting the child and expending that energy on this conflict, you just sit back and chill and you just offer more love in, in, in return. And I, I want to pick, I know this is a side thing, but the spending energy, I know as a mother, I don't have any extra to spend, right? Um, by the end of the day, we are pretty uh, depleted of energy. Um, and I, I like the, a long time ago, I, I mean, this is not, conscious parenting is not something that came natural to me. I have to give credit to Khan and how I have learned and grown over the years. But he gave me an example that he was this child was throwing the toys in the therapy room, and the mom is saying, "Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Don't throw it! We don't throw toys!" And it went on and on and on, and the behavior wasn't changing. It wasn't affected. And Khan goes over there and he picks up the toy and gently puts into the box. What do you think the child did? This is a two-year-old. Done. Just to convince ourselves that to be conscious parents, it may be a lot of work, but it's not. It's actually a lot less because it comes from our humanity and we can practice those qualities that we already value anyways. And we can be more authentic. And there's more room for the child to be authentic. And then we can love without all the stress and expectations that whatever the child does is a reflection, like if they don't comb their hair or whatever, it's a reflection that I'm a bad parent. You know, we put so much pressure already. So this is a method to conserve energy, but to be more effective. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to, because I think those are highlights that are very important since we live in such a busy world. Conserving energy is a huge motivator for me. And uh, something that we practice here, um, as, especially as a parent, right? Um, we don't uh, associate those two together. So we call it parental humility. But what it does is, is give, it gives you permission to let go of uh, everything, <laughs> insecurities. <laughs> Uh, problems, internal problems, um, of false appearances. Um, so it is probably one of the better practices as a parent. Humility helps us to realize that we do exist below all the problems and insecurities that suspends above us. Um, when we are contentious with our children, it, it behooves us to recognize what that self-interest may be as a parent, try to prove that we matter more by getting one up on the child to make us appear deprecating. That has probably evolved the um, techniques I'm using in counseling with therapy, therapy for children. There's is, is a whole lot of humility. I am directing, but I do it indirectly, and, but I do it with humility. And the child's watching me, and that's half the therapy, really. <laughs> the child's learning. Um, if, if you want to teach a child respect, right? That's a way to connect with the child first and foremost, and then to have the child watch and then uh, mimic, if not identify, right? Preferably, you want know, the child to identify to him with humility, where they embody that, and they become that in everything they do, everything manifested from them oozes out uh, humility. Number one, 
I like this. It's perhaps more of an Eastern response or approach, and that is to be equanimous. So, so attain equanimity in a moment um, of chaos. Um, equanimity is the calm that emerges from the chaos. This kind of calm is born specifically from wisdom. It is a mental balance. When the mind wavers, where the mind wavers, but it does not break. It is a mind that breaks, but it does not waver. This does not mean it is a mind without chaos, like excessive worries and anger and distress and self-doubt, but it is a mind that can ride the wave of mental chaos, the child, and acquire balance in the quietude of observation. So what I mean by that is things are always happening within and without. So the child's experiencing all kinds of or having all kinds of experiences internal, and so are you in relation to, right? There are certain things that may trigger both good or bad from you. Uh, the child pulls. It's not always bad. Love is something wonderful, right? Um, that the child pulls from you. But the point, the point here, things are always happening. So between the pulls of your experience yeah, and hers lies observation. And there, there's the even keel, there's the equanimity, the serene, the serenity. Yeah. So things are always happening around you, right? So equanimity is that thing that emerges from that, whatever that experience is, even in joy, right? So uh, some people enjoy standing on top of a mountain and looking down and it gives them a sense of peace. Sure, so in between that experience, your observation and the, the Emotion that you get out of that lies observation. And that's where I try to, so in the office, when I'm working with kids, or well, clients, I work with both kids and adults. Whatever happens within here and what I observe without there, um, I'm observing. And that's the conscious piece in the conscious parenting, right? So there's all the other beautiful pieces like the gratitude and the humility. Humility, yeah. appreciation, and the humility. <laughs> so a lot of that happening, right? Talk makes sense, I think, and I feel it. It does because it taps into your humanity. I think so. Now, th you, there have been contradictions. So there are parents who question this approach mm -hmm. because they're accustomed to the old ways, right? I'm a believer that 98% of us are authoritarian parents. We're dictators of some sort, some kind. We're somewhere on the spectrum. Yeah, so mild, moderate, and severe. But nonetheless, for example, and I only say this because I've been doing this for 18 years, and I'll ask parents, what is the most important thing you hope to teach your child in respect is always top three. If, if you, to respect is top three, you're an authoritarian. Respect in the eyes of the conscious is not even on the list of top 100 or 200. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the top 100 of the 200 is consciousness. <laughs> so yeah. conscious, 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 consciousness, because out of that is the beauty. That is, if it is authentically, if you're, if you're truly conscious. And we may have to define really what that means. I know Paul asked that last week, but we have to maybe clarify. Little bit so often, you know, we as human beings we are designed to grow, we are designed to connect, we are designed to always seek the best self that we can be. Now, things along the way kind of stunts that trauma, so on, you know, right? Society, <laughs> cultural norms, and those things can, can stunt that natural process for us, but it's always there. And what I have observed, and especially by being more traditional parent at one point and shifting, I have noticed that often the first piece of information that shows up in the room that is triggering for me, that's what I respond to. And I miss the 99% of the important information that follows, right? 
So I assume I know, I assume I'm right, I don't challenge that, and then I'm missing the opportunity to really learn my child. The most important thing in the world for me is my child, and I miss the opportunity to know him if I respond to the first piece of the information that triggers me. So as we observe in this equanimity process of observing and allowing the things to unfold a little longer before I jump the gun, I then realize I don't have to jump the gun. Connection, an opportunity for us to allow our child to unfold, which what we want is for them to grow. And they observe in the humanity within me, so they learn to be human. They're already like that, but they, that gets solidified for them. So the, this process of observing is not passive at all. It's a very active process of growth because often we're missing 98% of the information that we need to have. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, yeah. The most passive act of conscious parenting is, is the most active act, and then uh, that is the listening, mm -hmm. or proactive, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you recall, you will be more important than any form of discipline or consequence that you, you will give the child, or place upon the child. You will always be more important. So you can continue to punish your child the child gets missed the opportunity. The disconnection, it drives yeah. disconnection. Yeah. Not learning, not all the things we think we're teaching, we're driving disconnection, misunderstanding. Uh, you know, you understand that the teenager thing doesn't exist in our cultures, right? Right. It's primarily in ours, in the Western culture. We have created the teenagers that we so dislike. That's not a belief. I believe we call it a normal um, developmental process. Mm -hmm. By the time they're 12, 13, we understand that by that time, there's a shift in cognition in, 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 in their attitude, but it has nothing to do with what we think it does. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a natural maturity process, but we refer to it as an attitude, and we speak it as if um, it, it is a problem. Because I. I there's so much richness in this topic, and I want to make sure we unpack it. Um, and from this theory, from this understanding, from this information that's being disseminated, what does that actually look like? And the process is actually much simpler. It's, it's beautiful, and it's impactful and powerful, but the act of it is very simple. So to really imagine what respect is, right? If you're wishing for the child to respect you, how you want to respect them and demonstrate that. Children learn much more by observing than they ever will with your words, period. Human beings learn by modeling. We are primed for that. It is instinctual. Their survival depends on it, right? So one example, um, and I am, again, I'm Brazilian. You know, half of the time I'm not mindful, probably 98% of the time I'm not mindful. I'm barging in into rooms, I'm talking from another room, I do all these kinds of things, that con just gently looks at me. But very early on, we asked Jasmine permission to enter her room. You respect, we have you let your respect. I never asked her, have you knocked in my door before you enter? One time, ever, in her lifetime. But before I enter her room, I knock, and I wait for her to respond, because I, I haven't done the knocking and <laughs> For GN, that doesn't count. Right? <laughs> if you've done that, it doesn't count. You cannot put a, ooh, I knocked. No, you didn't. You thought impatience, not respect, right? So knock and wait. The empowerment for that child, so they don't have to steal that later in the teenager years. And then she learns. And guess what she does? She knocks before she enters. With that one word being spoken. Activity I am uh, challenging you to have. Imagine what you want and do for the child and watch it come back. You're not doing it for that. You're just doing to embody respect, right? But you can get respect. Any thoughts about that? 
Does that kind of help solidify some of those points that we highlighted? I think one of the really important things that you guys are are going around is, is really it's about the modeling of all of this. And I, I think, you know, you said like you can keep being authoritarian or you can keep, you know, doing all those things, but what it really breeds is that disconnection. And um, Paul and I were talking just recently about something I was reading and we were talking about that survival instinct is connection. And if we, go with the forms of punishment that we're typically used to in our society. And we might be able to coerce a child into a specific behavior or control a child into a specific behavior, right? When we lose mm -hmm. control once they realize they have some more autonomy in the teenagers. But I think the damage that's so easily done that I don't think any of us really realize, maybe right from the get if conscious parenting is new, is just the damage to that human spirit. To get them to do what we want, they will sacrifice self so that they are pleasing to us, so that they keep whatever connection they can muster. But we're the ones who control that. We're the ones who say, yes, you can have me, or no, you cannot because you are naughty, because you're bad, because you broke the rules, whatever it is. And like the responsibility of that, I'm the dispenser of my presence to you. And if we're so powerful, and that presence is what they like are biologically wired to crave from me, now I'm the one in, I can say no to that. And they will say no to themselves to get me back. And that like, I think as a, as a parent, if we can understand the gravity of that, like it's heartbreaking that we would ever make love conditional because that's really what it translates to the child is that, no, you can't have me. Oh, you yeah. that connection. And the damage yes. that that does to a human spirit that is a human from the moment they arrive <laughs> with their own, you know, wiring and unique perspective, like all those things are in there, even though they're very small and their bodies just aren't as big, but that person is still that person. And like, I'm, I've done it wrong a, a hundred times. And parenting, yes, if you're based, if not all, if you're a based parent. Yeah. We talked last week about like the tendency to projection, which is what 98% of the time mm -hmm. we do. And that, that um, applies to parenting as well. Nothing that we do that is parenting is really authentic um, because it comes from a place of concern or fear or uh, insecurities. Parenting, yes, if you're a basic, if not all, if you're a basic parent. Yeah. We talked last week about uh, the tendency to projection, which is what 98% of the time mm -hmm. we do. And that that um, applies to parenting as well. Nothing that we do that is parenting is really authentic um, because it comes from a place of concern or fear or uh, insecurities. It's, uh, it's about seven minutes long, but there are aspects of this story that I discussed that uh, give you an inkling to a couple of things. My, my struggle as a parent, and then how I learned to be a more conscious parent, but uh, uh, I just you not come. If mindfulness is nice, how come you not nice? and so on and so on and so on and continue. I just sat there in complete silence. I did not feel that I had the right to respond or make any, because if I did, I would have made excuses for, for which there were none. So skipping all of that, here's my point here in all of this, okay? The immediate situation that is with my daughter was about the moment what was happening in the moment. And she and I became that moment. Coming together and creating what we refer to as the parenting flow of communication. In this flow state, when the child is expressing herself completely, I'm not going to try to correct or change her mind. I'm merely flowing along the stream of her thoughts and riding the wave of her feelings as she shares them. I do not interrupt this flow state 
because it calls from me the need to pay attention. And to pay attention is to attend for me. To hear her out is to validate and support her regardless of what she says. In other words, when the child's expressing herself, she is revealed to us. And it becomes an opportunity to recognize her in the now. And our understanding of the now can only, be, can only occur if we are present to it. So what she shares is, was neither wrong nor right. The sharing itself is all but right. It is in this moment the parent creates a space of pure understanding that is ostensibly inviolate from bias or judgment. The child needs to feel understood and the parent can learn to understand. When the child feels understood, she is then open to growing. When the parent learns to understand, he is open to change. Albeit change may occur if I force it so. But it would be more meaningful if she tells me so. That is, her ability to reflect on her feelings and thoughts facilitates not only her growth process, but her parents' developmental parenting process. So our ability to sit, acknowledge, reflect on our reactions can provide the information we need to cultivate in us more mind and heart wisdom. That listening intently to her, telling me her story, is to say that by sharing what she feels and thinks, she is revealed to herself. Um, I'm not going to read the rest, but um, it was an hour-long talk. At least the first 45 minutes. The last 15 minutes, she decided that she wanted to role play. <laughs> which began with me having to recite this per her request. Can you please clean your room? Go ahead, Dada, she said. <laughs> so I complied. I delivered this message in the most humble, delicate, and sensitive way I could muster. Regulating my tone and calibrating my words to assure for the mindfulness she was anticipating. So I communicated, Jasmine, can you please clean your room? It was at this point that she took her right hand and placed it on my left cheek, very tenderly. Stared into my soul souls and said, that's good, Dada. Now do it again. <laughs> and so I did, a third time, a fourth time, We role play until her heart was content. She then gracefully ended this gruesome psychic death of a thousand cuts conversation with a sensational momento. Uh, that would be carved forever in my mind, and it still does, and that is that it be kind. So then anytime she enters the room, because that has become part of my mantra, and I make visual contact with her, it comes forth. Be kind. That kind of profound moment is the most powerful experience you can give a parent, a child, in yourself, right? It's a gift. It's so easy to think manners are important. It's so easy to focus on behavior and shaping behavior. But what you can do by being present is telling this child is valuable, this child is loved, this child is important, and her words matter, right? Like she can feel that in her soul. What human being that is loved and seen and understood, what they're gonna turn into when they're gonna go? They're gonna have manners, they're gonna have be kind. All those things are gonna come from the moment you share with a child. More than whatever you're trying to teach with words. There's no replacement for that. It was so powerful because I heard the story, I heard from fresh when it happened, and every time I'm cheerful. 
this is how powerful that moment is. I think that moment really shifted, and I've had by that point, it was uh, 14 years working with children, kids and families, for whatever reason, that moment really shifted uh, for me, uh, how I work with children going forward. And I, I thought I was conscious um, or attentive, uh, but I learned to be more so afterwards. And, uh, and I listen, and I listen the same, maybe different. It depends, um, but then I listen. I became less verbose um, because apparently I wasn't listening enough. At least it wasn't listening to myself. I think that's a, a tendency for, for us all who are insecure. Uh, if anything, we have the power of, and that's the power of deflection <laughs> um, as a parent, and, and the other is hypocrisy. But, but you learn, right? So in conscious parenting, there's an aspect of forgiveness that you offer yourself, also referred to as loving kindness. Because you have to offer, you have to really incorporate that. Uh, it, it takes you a, to a different space as a parent. Um, you can call it consciousness, but that whatever that is, that consciousness, becomes more vast and more deep uh, uh, as long as you can remain humble. Okay. That might be the scariest thing for parents. Um, I feel like it's hard to trust the long game there, right? It's hard mm -hmm. to trust that, Vivi, you had mentioned, if, if someone's loved and supported and connected to. Everything we want that we force will, you know, it'll come to be. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's... It's, and beyond our wildest imagination, mm -hmm. actually. Say that again, sorry. So sometimes what I wish is so limited. Oh, my right, yeah, it's beyond, yeah. Upbringing by my own family. It's better than what we imagine. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's best. But until you get to see it happen, it's like, uh, you know, what are some of the indicators I can find? I think that's where, that's where people can struggle. That's where we became so humble as we got to watch our daughter when she went to college. It was like we had her in this little cocoon, and then we got to watch her blossom. Mm. And, and we could really see that, oh my goodness, like we were really holding her because we were just so afraid. Like you said, that parenting out of fear. And like you said, it's like that game, like, is it gonna work out okay? Is it gonna, mm -hmm. like you said, and just trust that. Yeah. She's the most incredible human being. And today you'll say like, mom and dad, we could see, I can see where you were so afraid mm. with my choices. Um, and I was figuring it out. But I think the underlying thing is just knowing, like, we love you so much. I would tell her that. I love you so much. I'm just afraid of what might happen. Or I would, you know, and, and so I think that you said that whole, like, humbling and knowing, like, what is it triggering in me, I think mm -hmm. is such a valuable thing to look at. Of, for me, it was triggering fear. Something might happen to my daughter. Um, and then whatever it is maybe triggering. I don't want the toys on the floor. such a challenge in the world we live in, we talked about this before, is just the judgment everywhere we go, right? You talk about your child is throwing a tantrum in Walmart and immediately the, you know, the lens is on you and what, what were it to be if you were to get on the ground with your child and be on their level and 
mm -hmm. how many people are judging you, or just within a family unit, you know, mm -hmm. to go against the grain of what has been traditionally, you know, um, dad's dad's dad, you know, mm -hmm. how, how they all parented, and that you're gonna do it differently is to really present a major challenge and to be accepted. And a, another thing of thought that, that dropped in is, if this wasn't modeled for us, so we're doing a lot of unlearning, you know, there is so much that we have taken on, you know, um, so, to, so to do it so 180, you know, is to really take off layers and unlearn certain, certain things that were so deeply embedded and modeled for us. What is, what is this respect? I never experienced this, you know, this, or vulnerability or humility. I never saw any of that, you know. These are just thoughts that are coming in my mind, but. So it, it is, it's kind of coming from so far back into a neutrality and then moving forward from there. It's, it's just an interesting path, but interesting. And, and that is just what we are aware of, right? Like, so much of what we do is unconscious. We don't even know what is influencing what we're doing, or our fears, for example. Yeah, this is a, that's why this is a work on ourselves. And if we get ourselves in a better spot and, and we are mindful and we are attending, then we can create that space for the child to be well. But that's the trick. All the work is internal. And every time we talk about conscious parenting, I'm always like, and the reparent of <laughs> the self. Because like, you can't even be a conscious parent if you don't get into that place and go, oh, I never saw it, but... What would it have looked like? What would that have felt like? How would I have responded differently? What would my childhood have felt like or been like? And then really being able to go back into those places like with time and say, oh, okay, they couldn't do it because they didn't know how either. But now that I'm the adult version of myself, I can see what I needed in that moment. And now I can be the one who holds space and provides that. But mm. every time we talk about conscious parenting, I'm like, and there's conscious reparenting, right? It's like the sub clause <laughs> underneath it every time for, for so many of us. So we'll finalize it with this, okay? Uh, much of the conditioned rules parents create for children is nothing more than a reflection of the denial we received as children by our parents. For example, if we are playing inside the house and get scolded, and we create based on that experience, you can't play in the house. We don't know how to be a child because we're, we're not allowed to be. And we unconsciously give back to the child what we lack. When a rule is created and forced by us, is believed to be important, that is really nothing more than trauma. And a denial of the childhood for ourselves and now for the child. That's what you said. Um, questions or comments, uh, responses? How do we link this? To how, how do you prepare your child for a consequence-based world? Everything, everything once they leave our house is consequence-based. So they will learn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, if, if I, 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 that's my fear. That's my yeah. projection. I understand so, that. Yeah. Um, and Khan and I will answer this probably differently. We cannot imagine, because we live in a black and white conscious-based world, and we have conformed to it. Right. We cannot imagine someone that wasn't raised with that that is gonna be able to deal with that. They rise above, they see it through it, they challenge it. They are gonna respond so much better than we ever can. We cannot prepare them because we're not good enough. They, if we give them what they need, 
they will figure that out with ease, with ease. Uh, and I have, I, we don't have time, but I have tons of examples of how even my 14-year-old daughter challenges the system because she won't buy into it. She won't feel guilt. She won't feel shame that we do if we don't conform. It's amazing to see her navigate differently than I could ever imagine. So the only thing I'm gonna say then is trust the process. <clears throat> this is so hard. If you give what your child needs, you don't need to prepare them for that. I know it's difficult, but sure. yeah. Vivian, um, so I hear what you're saying for sure, um, but our kids, we adopted them. Mm -hmm. They came from extreme situations, extreme. And so, and you know, a couple of them were, you know, eight and above mm -hmm. when we got them. And so they had already spent that time in this, in different, they're all different, mm -hmm. but um, horrific situations. And as well as that, they're um, developmentally disabled, all four of them in different ways. And so, you know, I've experienced with at least one of them, if not all of them, and I've, I'm, I'm listening to this and going, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a horrible parent. But, um, working on that forgiveness thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we all have to come. But, but you know, if, if you have a, a foster child and you get to the restaurant and they're wearing two completely different shoes and, and acting like they've never sat at a table before, it, that to me, it felt like Okay, the pressure for sure, you know, these are foster kids and, and you're under a microscope for sure. So there's that. But where does letting them grow and develop meet, you can't wear two different shoes to the restaurant. You know what I'm saying? Uh, why not? Why can't, why can't you? Um, you're a conscious parent now. You wear two different shoes with her to the restaurant. So. It, it, that's the pressure I think I understand that we have to conform but to me that's not the kind of conformity um, that's the kind of conformity I just say that uh, strips the child of free agency and creativity mm -hmm. so uh, as conscious parents if we're, we're just flowing along that's not hurting or harming anyone that's true so so and and for whatever reason uh, the other thing about that is that you look at the underlying reason why that is so, that may not be explainable, but we do it anyways because the child's present in that space and in that place, in that mind space. Um, so I'm way past that day in the restaurant, yeah. and that boy is in a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. and that boy is in a group home where he's safe in another city, so mm -hmm. how do I go back and repair that with him? Mm. Mm. How old is he? He's, um, 20. he's 20, physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he's probably eight. eight, 10, if we're lucky, um, emotionally and mentally, mm -hmm. and probably emotionally not even that much. Yeah, and when he regresses, he's down to a two-year-old or having mm -hmm. a tem temper tantrum, right? He or really hasn't like stood much of a chance. Um, yeah. He... So where he started was horrific, and then I can see where where we maybe made I've made yeah mistakes right. mm. that were probably detrimental to him. Mm. Uh, you still have a connection with him? Oh yes, okay. yes. He calls me every day. He says, mm -hmm. "Mama, this is what I did today." Mm. And, and that that right there, right there, is the important piece. Um, we can look back and look at all the things that we've made of problems and issues, and boy, will we beat ourselves up yeah. over and over and, and to, to no end. Um, but what you have is the present, what you have is the moment. The fact that he's still connecting with you, there's still something 
that, uh, that sort of pulls him into that um, desire to maintain connection. So from this po point forth, it's really because he's still childlike in some way, especially, it depends on the day, I would imagine. You can't even predict, right? Mm -hmm. or, or can you? It, yeah. It's inconsistent. Right. Yeah. It inconsistent. He also has radical attachment disorder. Okay. So he doesn't attach to anything. Yeah. So the fact that he does call me and says, hey, that mama, you know, I, and I think, uh -huh. I'm a, I, he does it some with Keith, yeah. but I'm his main yeah. attachment. But every day he says, he says, where's, where's my dad? Where's my dad? Get my dad. You know, so he's reaching out, trying to build that. Um, I'm... And my, so my question is just how to repair that damage. Uh, you, you probably can't, but what you can is moving forward. So even if he slips, and he will continue to slip, I would imagine for the foreseeable future, you're there to watch him. You're not there to help him out. <coughs> you're just there to watch him, unless he wants help, right? Um, unless he asks for you to support him. Um, but they don't even take that uh, uh, autonomy, autonomy from him because he, He's in a situation that's already difficult, so we do everything we can to support him. He regresses or he uh, falls back, you remind him. And that's all you can be is this bell of mindfulness that repeats itself over and over if you have to a thousand times a day. And what you do now matters. We, we may not be able to change the past, but he connects with you now. So the students of the there's something that he still needs from. So now being present, listening, being supportive, it's important. And, and for all of us, it's a daily work. I'm a psychologist. I've been exposed to conscious parenting for many, many years, and I still falter every day. Depends on my day. Am I hungry? Am I tired? Did I work too much, right? Like, when I come in, my, my mindfulness can be a zero, uh, and I will perform as such, right? So again, the compassion towards self, because we are human, and we cannot be fix something that we didn't know, right? But the process starts now. Every day is an opportunity to grow, to learn, to enhance connection. And it always starts now, over yes. and over. The now yes. Right, yes. is the only thing that's happening repeatedly. Um, and you just stay there. You stay present to it. And the moment can be repairable. The moment right now can be repaired. Right? So it's very, very powerful. Don't miss any opportunity you have in the present moment. You guys heard about my German grandmother, right? No? Two minutes, really quick. So once in a while, my German, she was very cold and mean and critical and harsh. And I, she was primarily the one that raised because my mom worked full time. And once in a while, I channel her. And I tell you, she comes out of nowhere. Like, I don't care how mindful I am and how much I study, that German grandmother comes out full force out of me. And, um, one time she came out, and I could see in Jasmine's eyes her soul breaking. You know, that moment she came out, I, didn't, I couldn't hold her back. I didn't even notice until I saw my daughter's brown eyes breaking. And then I was like, and then she just backed away and left. And I was left with a sense of dread and guilt and shame and like, what am I doing, right? This is not important. Later on, I talked to my... To Jasmine and I say, Jasmine, I, I have to share something. And I shared with her my German grandmother. And, and I said, uh, I'm so sorry she came out. I want you to understand there is nothing that you've done that deserved that. She lives within me and she comes out once in a while. Sometimes I can hold her back and sometimes I cannot. Uh, but I don't want you to think it's you. And she goes, Mom, I'm so glad. <laughs> you shared this with me because I thought that I'm broken. That was the message I gave my child. It had nothing to do with it. And I said, no, Jasmine, I'm broken. 
And if you help me, because sometimes I'm aware that she's out, and sometimes I don't even notice, would you please, if you see her coming out, let me know so I can put her back in. And she goes, oh, okay, mom, I'll help you with that. Very forgiving, very forgiving. Powerful moment, right? We're not expected to be perfect, but we have to be aware right? and communicate so. Well, this was intense. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, next week, we are working on a workbook, so we're going to have a few pages of that for you.